Well, good morning. It's a delight to see you today. I trust that you've had a good morning so far, and it certainly has been a good week, and the privilege to be with you is one for which uh, Lenise and I will continue to be grateful for months to come. Thank you for your every hospitality and kindness and interaction, encouragement to us. Uh, we've enjoyed getting to get to uh, get to know many of you, and uh, Lord willing, we'll look forward to staying in touch and trust uh, the Lord to build upon our uh, friendship that has begun this week. Thank you, Mr. President, for your invitation, your introduction, your kindness to us, and uh, thank you for shepherding us out to get us to the plane on time uh, today. So forgive us for it. We don't want to be rude at the end, but uh, we don't want to be left behind uh, either. So uh, here, here, here we go. So this week, we have focused on the indispensability of theology for Christian living in all aspects of our lives. We talked on the first day about theology being the backbone of the church. On the second day about theology being the foundation for all of life. Yesterday, a good theology leading to doxology and doxology preparing the way for service. And today we're going to try to bring those together as we think about head, heart, and hands uh, together. In order to do so, I would like to read a passage of scripture as we begin. 2 Timothy Chapter 3, a passage that I'm sure you know well, verses 14 through 17. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 through 17. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the person of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. This is the word of the Lord. So today's approach is going to be a little bit different. We're going to try to address today's topic through the window of the life of Billy Graham. I think it has something to say to us about some key events in his life of how theology, evangelism, and missions come together. In order to do that, we have four big questions today. Number one, what can we learn from Billy Graham? Number two, what can we learn from Mr. Graham's theological commitments when, about theology connecting with evangelism and missions. Thirdly, what lessons can we learn when thinking about global evangelization and world missions? And fourthly, are there markers of hope and encouragement for us today in looking through this window? So that's what we're going to try to do as we think about theological commitments for evangelism and missions. In the fall of 2017, I was invited to write an article with the title, The Authority of the Bible, for Decision Magazine, the regular publication of the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. I was honored to pen this piece, especially in light of the fact that it provided the commentary on one of the key turning points in the life of Billy Graham in the summer of 1949. A moment described by Mr. Graham in his autobiography, Just As I Am, as well as by several of his biographers. I want this morning to use the life and ministry of Mr. Graham as a window to help us think about these theological commitments and how they connect with evangelism and mission. The summer of 1949 presented Mr. Graham with a critical decision, which became a historical moment in his life. Chuck Templeton was a Canadian who had a religious experience at the age of 19 in 1934, the same year that Billy Graham had responded to the gospel at the age of 16 at a Mordecai Ham revival in Charlotte, North Carolina. Templeton had become a well-known preacher, and he and Mr. Graham met at the Chicago Stadium at a Youth for Christ rally in 1945. 
They were introduced to one another by T Tory Johnson, who slapped both men on the back and said, you both have a lot in common. I hope you'll become good friends. Templeton was three years older than Graham, and in some ways the initial leader in the friendship, a friendship about which Mr. Graham would l later write, he was one of the few colleagues I ever loved in this life. He and I had been so close. In 1948, Templeton enrolled at Princeton Seminary, the same year that Mr. Graham accepted the unpaid position of president at Northwestern Bible College. Don't tell your board that they have such <laughs> things. While at Princeton, Templeton encountered critical approaches and methodologies to the study of the Bible that led to an erosion of his faith, eventually leading him to abandon the ministry and the Christian faith. So how did something like this take place with such a gifted person? I would like to suggest that while Mr. Templeton was seemingly aggressive in his zeal for evangelism, he lacked the theological underpinnings necessary to sustain his commitments. In his graduate study, he heard these things as he identified them. Modernity had divorced humanity from any true knowledge of eternity, focusing instead on the existential, the inward, and personal experience. Concepts of divine intervention in history were replaced with natural processes and expectations as the coming of God's kingdom was reinterpreted in light of human progress. Similarly, divine providence was replaced with the concept of human advance with general education as the means for such advance rather than gospel proclamation. And perhaps most significantly, the concept of sin was downplayed and human rationalism was elevated while hope in divine revelation and the truthfulness of Scripture was denigrated. In some, modernity emphasized temporal freedom, reason, and morality while losing a concern for heaven, hell, and final judgment. By diminishing the truthfulness and authority of Holy Scripture as the written word of God, modernity invited people to ignore the divine aspect of Scripture and encouraged everyone to interpret the Bible as we would any other human book. Chuck Templeton tried to encourage Mr. Graham to join him to enroll in seminary at Princeton. But Mr. Graham's life was full with his marriage, his new presidency, and his expanding evangelistic ministry with Youth for Christ. In 1949, Templeton and Graham met at the Taft Hotel in New York City for a visit together. Templeton said to Graham on that occasion, Billy, you're 50 years out of date. People no longer accept the Bible as inspired the way you do. You've committed intellectual suicide. The word stung. Mr. Graham was dejected. His friend had turned away from him. A few weeks later at the Forest Home Conference Center in San Bernardino, California, where Graham had been invited to speak, he went outside to take an evening walk on the hillside, continuing to reflect on the stinging conversation with Chuck Templeton. Out in the moonlight after wrestling with the question regarding the truthfulness of the Bible, the evangelist in tears fell to his knees and he placed the Bible on a tree stump. And there he made a commitment in August of 1949 at the Forest Home Retreat Center where after wrestling with Templeton's haunting questions, Mr. Graham confessed the Bible to be the inspired written word of God. Graham claimed that he felt the presence and power of God at that moment in a way that he had never experienced it before. This renewed commitment regarding the truthfulness of Scripture and the transformational realities of the gospel framed Graham's preaching from that day forward, anchored in a theological understanding of what the Bible says, a phrase that characterized his preaching through the years. Interestingly enough, 1949 was also the year of the famous Los Angeles Crusade, which took place shortly after the Forest Home Retreat Center encounter. The Lord used the Los Angeles Crusade to introduce Billy Graham to North America and eventually to the world. As with Mr. Graham, so for us as well. The foundation for proclaiming the truthfulness of the gospel is found in the Bible 
God's inspired word to us. The Bible describes itself as a special book. Even before the canonization of the sacred books, importance was attached to these writings. Moses referred to these writings as everything the Lord had said in the book of the covenant. Joshua's farewell address was written in the book of the law of God. Similarly, the prophets and the apostles thought of their writings as the very words of God. Romans chapter 3 verse 2. And Jesus declared the script is the word of God that cannot be broken. John 10, 35. The Apostle Paul confessed, as we read, all scripture is God-breathed. We also can and must affirm that the prophetic apostolic word is God's word written. Without this inspired writing, there would be no scripture, no word from God available to us. We find in inspired scripture a message about God and his purposes, including the creation of the universe and the redemption of his people. The Bible describes the call of Abraham, the giving of the law, the establishment of the kingdom, and the division of that same kingdom, as well as the captivity and restoration of Israel. Scripture sees humankind as fallen from a sinless condition, now separated and alienated from God, apart from God's salvific grace. The promise of the coming Messiah who will redeem men and women and reign as king appears throughout the Old Testament. And the message of redemption in the Word of God claims that believers are restored to favor with God by faith in the sacrificial and atoning death of Jesus Christ who indeed was the promised Messiah. Our response of faith to this word recorded and interpreted by the prophets and the apostles as noted on Wednesday calls for us to embrace with humility and teachable hearts without finding fault whatever is taught in Holy Scripture. So with Billy Graham, we recognize the confession of Jesus as the Christ, the Savior of the world, is at the heart of the Christian faith and is central to the meaning of Holy Scripture. With this recognition, we affirm the Bible's inspiration, truthfulness, authority, and normative nature. And it is there where we find the good news of the gospel. An affirmation that the Bible is fully inspired and totally truthful is important because it is the foundation that establishes the complete extent of the Bible's authority. So contrary to Chuck Templeton, we must choose to articulate a view of the Bible for the contemporary community of faith that is faithful to and in continuity with the consensus of the historic positions in the church that have characteristically recognized the Bible as the written word of God. The Bible remains the primary source of God's self-revelation of His people. Even though times and cultures change, the basic needs shared by women and men of all ages and races in all times and cultures generally remains the same. And this message of God is authoritative and normative and applicable as much for faithful Christ followers in the 21st century as it was in the first. We acknowledge that Scripture speaks to the spiritual needs of men and women, but more importantly, it reveals the truth of and about God Himself. We therefore confess that all Scripture is inspired and is the truthful and authoritative word for God's people. Beyond these affirmations and articulations about the Word of God, we commit ourselves to it as we seek to carry out the evangelistic and missional task that has been given to the church. In that regard, we once again have much to learn from the life and ministry of Billy Graham. For one cannot understand the impact of Mr. Graham apart from his theological commitments to Scripture and the Gospel. But let's back up just a little bit. After hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ proclaimed by evangelist Mordecai Ham at an evangelistic meeting in Charlotte, North Carolina in 1934, Billy Graham at the age of 16, along with his good friend Grady Wilson, responded to the invitation hymn, Just As I Am. 
This beautiful and moving gospel song, which was written by Charlotte Elliott in 1835, became the well-known invitation hymn for numerous crusade services led by Mr. Graham, as the title of his autobiography suggests. William Franklin, Billy Frank, as he was known to his childhood friends, Graham was born on November the 7th, 1918. And he went to be with the Lord about 18 months ago, February 21st, 2018, at the age of 99, having believed, lived, and proclaimed that we come to Christ without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. The 20th century's best-known preacher proclaimed the gospel to more people than anyone in history. An ordained Southern Baptist minister, Mr. Graham, preached to an estimated 215 million people in 185 countries on six continents over six decades of ministry. It's actually astounding. He also was heard or seen by millions more on radio, television, film, video, and webcast. Entrepreneurial in spirit, interdenominational in practice, America's pastor, as he was often called, was instrumental in the launch of dozens of other ministries, including the Hour of Decision, Decision Magazine, Christianity Today, Worldwide Pictures, and the founding of Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary. One cannot understand the entrepreneurial and transdenominational character of the global evangelical movement apart from understanding the full-orbed reach of Graham's ministry. Beyond his shaping influence in North America, Graham joined with British evangelical leader John R. W. Stott to initiate the work of the Lausanne movement, which was built upon the efforts of the 1966 World Congress on Evangelism in Berlin, which was hosted by none other than Billy Graham. A graduate of Wheaton College, where Graham met his wife, Ruth, he served briefly as a pastor and, as I said, an unpaid president at Northwestern Bible College. It was his work as an evangelist, however, which started with the days of Youth for Christ in the 1940s that became his passion and his life's work. The eight-week Los Angeles Crusade of 1949 was the event that made Graham's name a household word across the country, and the media provided abundant attention for the North Carolina farm boy. The 1957 New York City Crusade continued for 16 weeks and was attended by 2.4 million people. From that point forward, his mission and ministry became the model for preachers all across North America. Church services were patterned after Graham's campaigns, often concluding with an invitation hymn for people to respond to the gospel as the congregation sang all six verses of Just As I Am. The incredible life, ministry, influence, and legacy of Billy Graham have been well chronicled. While we knew the day would come when Mr. Graham's presence would no longer be with us, the reality that such a day has arrived is still hard to believe. The implications for his absence to the far-reaching and sweeping role that he played in such a visible way for more than a half century are hard to comprehend. For most of his life, his church membership was at the First Baptist Church of Dallas, Texas. Though I personally had the privilege to meet him and to be with him on a handful of occasions, like others, I primarily observed this anointed man from afar. Not only did he serve as America's pastor, but he was the public face and ambassador for the global evangelical movement. In so many ways, North American evangelicalism was defined and embodied by Billy Graham. In today's context, in which the concept of evangelicalism is quite vague, often misunderstood, and over-politicized to the media and others, it will likely become harder to hold the evangelical movement together without Mr. Graham. Not only will his vast influence in that area be missed, but we will also miss his dedicated efforts to wed together evangelism with social justice, as well as his desire to connect evangelism to theology and intellectual seriousness. In 1949, Billy Graham's evangelistic crusade in Los Angeles put Graham on the map, thanks to the unbelievable attention provided by the Los Angeles media. 
Now Graham had become the movement's architect and spokesman, with Carl Henry serving as the movement's lead theologian and Harold Ockengay serving as the movement's strategist and organizer. The 1957 crusade was pivotal for defining Mr. Graham's non-separatist approach, which characterized this new evangelical movement over against the fundamentalist. The fundamentalist leaders labeled Graham as apostate, because he violated the separatist tendencies of the fundamentalist movement. A story told with great insight by historian Grant Wacker in his splendid biographical work on Mr. Graham called America's Pastor. Evangelical leaders in the middle of the 20th century rejected fundamentalism while holding on to the fundamentals representing in the best of the Christian tradition that runs through the Reformation, Puritanism, Pietism, and the Great Awakenings. 20th century evangelicals led by Billy Graham could be characterized as being theologically orthodox, gospel-centered, culturally engaged, intellectually serious, and transdenominational. And the theological orthodoxy for Mr. Graham can be traced to that pivotal and transformational moment in the summer of 1949. Without those commitments, I dare say that the life and ministry of Billy Graham as we knew it would have come to take place. And the implications for the evangelical movement of which we are a part of willingly or unknowingly at times would not be the same as it is today. Now Graham had become the movement's architect. And so moving from that particular place, we have to Think about evangelicalism without Billy Graham as the architect. Our 21st century world is anything but a unified, flourishing movement in North America as we think about how the evangelical world connects. In fact, without the presence and influence of Mr. Graham, the movement's unity and health are in serious jeopardy. Following the patterns of Billy Graham's ministry, we need to hold together the priority of evangelism and the need for social ministry, a vision for global missions and intercultural service, an unhindered gospel presentation and an informed contextualization, careful biblical interpretation coupled with spirit-enabled proclamation, serious theological reflection combined with humble cultural engagement and renewed rigorous scholarship that is not disconnected from faithful churchmanship characterized by proclamation, worship, and a sense of community praise and service. Evangelicals without Mr. Graham need not fall into the waiting arms of a revisionist progressivism that mirrors the teaching encountered by Chuck Templeton at Princeton but neither should they steer toward a reductionistic fundamentalism. Neither a new form of liberalism nor a reactionary fundamentalism, however, are wise options at this time for the sake of evangelism, missions, or the health of the church. What is needed is a biblical orthodoxy, a historic Christianity, a faithful intercultural transcontinental and intergenerational Christianity grounded in the truthfulness of the Bible and the transforming power of the gospel. Such a big tent vision needs wisdom to avoid unintentionally moving in the direction of an unhealthy inclusivism or heterodoxical universalism. We need a Revelation 7 vision that is sensitive to both the cross-cultural and intercultural matters, reflecting a call to humility, gentleness, patience, and forbearance, accompanied by a diligence to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Evangelicals need to prioritize their calling as agents of reconciliation in a world characterized by fragmentation and political polarization, understanding anew the heritage that shaped the movement without ever losing the priority focused on evangelism and gospel proclamation. 
uh, recognizing how different our context is today in 2019 from that of Mr. Graham's in 1949. We need courage to affirm first order essentials that have been believed and confessed throughout church history. An emphasis on historical orthodoxy is essential, but an appeal to orthopraxy cannot be ignored. We are deceiving ourselves if we think there is not an interconnectedness between orthodox theology and faithful evangelistic proclamation. Billy Graham was certainly not the first person who envisioned taking the gospel to the world. It was his vision for global evangelization and world missions that shaped so many over the past six decades. William Carey, the father of world missions, the shaper of the First Baptist Missionary Society, is generally credited with the idea of taking the gospel to the whole world. Yet, Mr. Graham has proclaimed the gospel in more countries than any other person in history, having been assisted by a magnificent team, the use of mass media, and the enablement of technology. In March of 1995, through the use of satellite technology, Billy Graham was able to broadcast from San Juan, Puerto Rico, to the entire world. He had previously conducted satellite crusades in Asia, Africa, and Germany, but never simultaneously, nor had anyone else, to a worldwide audience. Mr. Graham's global awareness and influence had its inception in the spring of 1946 when Youth for Christ became an international organization. The new effort, led by Graham and Tory Johnson, launched a 46-day ministry tour of Great Britain. Following this trip, Graham returned to Great Britain for a six-month tour where, listen, he spoke for 360 times in a half a year. During this period, the Lord granted him a concern for the world. Before long, his ministry was extended throughout Europe and into Asia. As William Carey had been given a vision, a dream for a great conference that would bring people together for world evangelization in Cape Town, South Africa in the early 19th century, something which actually took place a hundred years later at Edinburgh in 1910. So Mr. Graham envisioned such a great conference and the meeting came together in Berlin in 1966 around the theme of one race, one gospel, one task. The 1966 conference served as the forerunner for the 1974 Luzon Conference, which was co-led with John Stott. The 1974 gathering launched what we call the Luzon Movement. The 1974 gathering brought 2,400 Protestant leaders from 150 countries together to participate in a 10-day Congress on World Evangelization. The growth of the evangelical movement across the global south can largely be traced back to this particular conference. The Lausanne Conference led to the Amsterdam Conference in 1983 and 1986. It is difficult to measure the influence of these two conferences on evangelism around the world. A great impetus to world evangelization developed from these conferences. And all of this culminated in Amsterdam 2000, a nine-day conference in which 10,732 representatives from 209 countries came together to focus on new and more effective ways to proclaim the gospel throughout the world. During this time, many people in North America continued to ask who would be the next Billy Graham. But these international representatives at this conference in 2000 began to pray not necessarily for the next Billy Graham, but for thousands of evangelists who would take the gospel to every nation, to, to every people group around the globe. And today, I pray that some of those evangelists may come from this campus here at Canadian Southern Baptist Seminary.
To that end, I would encourage you to be a part of the Journey program, 10 a.m. on Tuesday, as opportunities to seek direction in your life, to find encouragement for God's will for the avenue of service in which you can be invested and involved. It must be noted that millions of people have responded to the gospel through the preaching ministry of Billy Graham. Percentage-wise, the largest number of these decisions have come from outside North America and Western Europe. Graham crossed many barriers, especially with ministry in the former Soviet Union, China, and North Korea. As we prepare the next generation of leaders on campuses like this one, let's encourage this new generation to learn from the example of Billy Graham, including his commitments to Scripture and his efforts to wed together evangelism, theology, global evangelization, and social witness for the cause of the gospel. Throughout his life, Mr. Graham made the world the focus of his ministry, and the world heard him gladly. The expansion of the gospel across the global south in the 21st century is certainly one of the most amazing works of God throughout church history. But one of his instruments for this amazing awakening, for this global focus, has been the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. We now find ourselves in this global context of the 21st century, and it presents us with what I believe is a new opportunity, one in which we will face great challenge and great change, but also have reason for great hope. If we look around us and all we see are trends and signs such as secularism, the rise of the new atheism, the new liberalism, and various fundamentalist reactions, we will likely become greatly discouraged. When we hear talk of the decline of Christianity in North America and an embattled evangelicalism whose young people have a spirituality characterized by what Christian Smith, the sociologist, has called moralistic therapeutic deism, we can easily get pulled off track. But I would like to suggest as we move toward the conclusion of our time together this week that it's time for us to move the conversation in a more hopeful direction. Even as this week we tried to frame spiritual emphasis quite differently from the vacuous moralistic therapeutic deism that has shaped the culture that many have known. Without losing our heritage and key distinctives that have shaped the Christian tradition, we no longer need to look solely to the Western Hemisphere for the future of the Christian faith. It's time for us to think more globally. And it is imperative that we do so. In 1900, 80% of the Christians in the world lived in Europe and America. But in 2000, 60% of the Christians in the world were found in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. An immense change. We must turn our attention away from intramural and denominational squabbles at home in order to see what God is literally doing around the world through the work of His Spirit. During the 20th century, Africa has been transformed from a continent that was 10% Christian in 1900 to one that is 46% Christian today. It is astonishing to see what God is doing there. There are now more Christians on the continent of Africa than there are citizens in the United States of America. Over the last 100 years, Christianity has grown from 10 million professing believers in Africa to over 360 million. And by 2025, the most conservative estimates are if these trends continue, in Africa there will be 630 million believers. In Latin America, around 640 million. And in Asia, more than 500 million. Let us not miss the fact that these same kinds of directional influences are present in North America as well. For wherever denominations here are growing, they are largely growing among Asians, Hispanics, and other minorities.
God's Spirit is moving around the globe and it is time for us to look in different ways with new eyes and fresh viewpoints as we see the world rather than the old lenses that we have employed in the past. While continuing to struggle with enlightenment and post-enlightenment issues about which we've discussed this week, our brothers and sisters in Africa face the challenges of the demonic and intense persecution from Islam on a daily basis. As we look at them and their world, they seem much more closely identified with apostolic Christianity than anything most of us have ever known or experienced. But please hear this word. We must also realize that our struggles are not against fellow Christ followers, but rather against demons, secularism, and unbelief. What is at stake if we do not take our eyes off the intramural squabbles that seem to characterize most denominations and which have characterized our Baptist world for several decades is not only a loss of the unity within the Christian movement, but also a loss of the mission focus of the Christian movement in the West. What we need, as noted earlier, is a fresh commitment to a biblical orthodoxy, a historic Christianity, a faithful, transgenerational, transcontinental, multi-ethnic movement that stands or falls on first order issues. Without forsaking our denominational distinctives, we're called to a commitment to gospel commonalities that are more important and precede our denominational distinctives. Things such as a commitment to the divine nature and authority of God's written word, the deity and humanity of Jesus Christ, a heartfelt confession of the Holy Trinity, the uniqueness of the gospel message, the enabling work of God's Spirit, salvation by grace through faith alone, the importance of the church and the people of God who are both gathered and scattered, the hope of Christ's return, and the sacredness of life and family. In the 21st century church, we must learn to disagree graciously over our differences. We may not find ways to agree on a wide variety of secondary and tertiary issues, but we must find ways to connect and recreate context of belonging for the multiple generations and various ethnic groups within the body of Christ. What is also needed for our day is the reclamation of a model of dynamic theological orthodoxy. The orthodox tradition must be recovered. One that is in conversation with the great history of the church. The great intellectual tradition that traces its way from Nicaea to Chalcedon. From Augustine to Bernard. From Luther to Calvin. From Wesley to the Pietist. And on to the revivals and the great awakenings. Resulting in what J.I. Packer and Thomas Oden have called the one faith that has largely been believed by all of God's people in all places at all times. A recommitment to such a confessional integrity will help us recover a call to the unity of the Christian faith in accord with the Nicene affirmation that sees the church as one holy, universal, and apostolic. All of us in this changing 21st century world must recommit ourselves afresh to the oneness and the universality of the church. This recommitment must also be supported by the right sort of virtues, a oneness that calls for humility, gentleness, patience, forbearance, a love and diligence to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We trust that God will help us to do so. Along with these things will be needed a global perspective that includes a renewed dedication to racial reconciliation in our various contexts. Looking forward to a day in which the great multitude from every nation, all tribes and all people groups and tongues shall stand before the Lamb as proclaimed and promised in Revelation chapter 7 verse 9. Certainly we need convictions and boundaries. But we also need a spirit of cooperation 
to build bridges. We need to understand that our various denominational distinctives do matter. But more importantly, what is needed today is a fresh kind of transgenerational, transcontinental approach to the Christian faith. We need a new spirit of mutual respect with those whom we might have differences of conviction on less important matters. A new kind of conviction characterized by new humility. It is possible, yes, it's very possible, to hold hands with sisters and brothers who disagree on secondary matters of theology and work together in evangelism and mission for the common good to extend the work of the gospel and the kingdom of God on this earth. Partnerships that will pull us out of our inward focus. This is particularly the case when we can work together with Trinitarian Christians from across the board in evangelism, missions, Christian higher education, in social action, cultural engagement, and matters involving the public square, including religious freedom, marriage, sexuality, and beginning and end of life issues. But please hear this. And yes, I'm still a Baptist. We will do congregational life with those whom we share common beliefs. Not only with those whom we agree on primary matters of faith, but with those who share commonalities regarding polity and the ordinances as well. And if this is true, and we, if it's true that we can do more together than alone, and if we need accountability and connections for our work, which I would wholeheartedly affirm, then denominational restructures that reflect the best of the Baptist heritage could well become God's agent for reconciliation and unity in the days ahead. At least we can so pray. We can trust God to bring a fresh wind of His Spirit, to bring renewal to our theological convictions and to our shared work to revive our service so that we can relate to one another in love, thereby inspiring true fellowship and community and to bring new hope and renewal to Christians, churches, and denominational entities as well. So let us join together in asking God to grant to us a renewed commitment to the gospel to the scriptures, to the church, to the work of evangelism and missions, bringing about a new spirit of cooperation for the good of God's people around the globe. And let us work together to advance the gospel and trust God to bring forth fruit from our labors, resulting in renewal to both churches and our denominational worlds as well as for the work of the Canadian Southern Baptist Seminary and College for the days ahead, for the glory of our great God. Thank you very much.